I'm a first generation farmer. I didn't grow up on a farm. I didn't inherit a farm. I started a farm. Um, my wife hates it when I say this, but I read a book, Fast Food Nation. Probably some of you are familiar, and it was completely appalling. And so I decided it was, it was our responsibility to raise our own food, and that's how we got started. We had the chickens and sort of spiraled uh, up slowly as we went. So um, feel free to ask any questions at the end. We're going to have a, a question and answer session with four panelists. We're going to give a presentation, uh, and then at the end, we'll get a chance to ask questions. Go around the room. If you have more questions, and everybody also will give you the their contact information is on the app, I believe. But if you want more information, uh, you can get it through, through all of our websites and whatever. Um, so I'm going to get started with our first panelist. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jason Amundsen, and I am a co-owner. And uh, this is my wife Lucy. She'll be playing after me, and I'm going to be covering kind of the beginning of our company from when we started in 2012 to our launching, hopefully soon, of a frozen custard. And custard is a uh, product of ice cream and sugar and yolks. Uh, as we jokingly say, we own half each of the debt of our company. And if you read her book, which she'll talk about briefly in her presentation, it's called Locally Laid. And uh, we call it entrepreneurial and or agricultural uh, contraception. It is definitely uh, a, a real take of what it takes to go from zero to starting up a farm with no agricultural experience. So this is an old picture from our farm when we started locally late, and uh, I learned how to feed from a farmer in Maryland. So we started with 1,800 chickens. Uh, this is the picture of the feeders that we used, that we built, and it turns out that this feeding system was a disaster on every single level. Uh, the short story is we moved to a cool AUHL feeder system, and uh, we also used a range feeding system at our farm, which is far, far more effective. Uh, we would put the feed out in the morning, the chickens would be hungry in the afternoon. We didn't get the production that we needed, and uh, a lot of food was wasted um, with this system. Uh, this is me. I'm sure many of you will recognize that coat. Uh, that is my only thing left from my army uniform. Um, so I had a flock of five chickens in our backyard, and I lost my job, not once, uh, but twice. And my brother, uh, two years younger than me, attempted suicide in Cambodia. He took 300 100 milligram tablets of phenobarbital and is still alive. Uh, he was on life support, and my mom and I flew out to Cambodia to take care of him. And um, I really came back a changed man. I said, uh, I want to start a chicken farm. And uh, let me assure you that that was not an aphrodisiac. Uh, it did not stir a lot of passion and excitement for my wife. Um, and uh, after that, uh, as they say, I was rendered. I was rendered on cubicle, as they say. Yeah, I came back from Asia. So it was not easy going from five chickens to the number of chickens, and uh, obviously there's things to talk to me about the watering systems, the feeding systems, all that we have to learn. Of course, the labeling, the packing, the distribution, all the requirements that it takes to start something from nothing, especially if you have no background doing it. Uh, what I want to talk about briefly was buying birds. So in the language of egg laying hens, the term is a pullet, and a pullet is a bird that's either 16 to 20 weeks old, ready to lay, so she don't have to do the work of raising that bird. And we went through that process of procuring pullets. Um, anyone knows you can go to a feed store and pick up 10 chickens at the local uh, feed mill. And Big Ag has the capacity to turn out 30,000 birds, 45,000 birds, 300,000 birds. But we're going into the span of what we call middle agriculture, which doesn't really exist much in the United States. But we needed 1,800. So after an exhaustive search, we kind of bet everything on a guy. And this guy, um, no, it was not, no. Yeah. We wish it was someone, someone better than the guy that we got. Um, yes, we found him on the internet, which is a reliable thing you never do. Uh, you never want to predicate your success of a venture on a guy. Which is 
an extremely large event in northern Minnesota. Packed up his chickens. See you, Dr. Reese. Well, we can hear you, but the recording won't be kept if you don't use that. Use this? Yes, sir. Yes. All right, does this work? No. It's not on. Does this work now? All right, here we go. So uh, this guy we based our entire company on packed up the chickens on Grandma's Marathon weekend and the birds sat in heat. They sat in traffic. And we waited and we waited and we waited. And as they say, it was less than optimal. Another way of saying it was horrible. They, it was, they were dehydrated, they were panicky, and it was a nightmare. Uh, the birds were dehydrated and skinny and injured. And as it turns out, we found out later, they had never, ever seen the sun. So the birds arrived, uh, completely unaccustomed to the sun, and they got inside our hoop coops and they simply ran. And they ran and they ran and they ran back and forth and they began piling. One, two, seven, ten, and they piled in the corner and they died. So we would take out trash bags every day of, of birds until they acclimated to the sun. It was, uh, as I say, not optimal. Um, so another example is these birds here are not roosting. The birds simply are uh, unaccustomed to having roosts. So we would put them up one at a time by hand. As things went along, we were able to develop partner farm relationships. These are other farmers who work with Locally Laid, and it has been a very, very uh, successful operation in many sense. Uh, but our real challenges center around the ability to uh, get a clear idea of supply and demand. And it's worked really well because as you can imagine, the Amish are really, really good farmers and they lack uh, the ability to market their product. And many, many questions have been asked about why do we work for the Amish? And uh, this is your answer. It's right here. That's why we work with the Amish. <laughs> So, uh, quick, a quick story about um, when we began the process of starting the company, we flunked our first inspection. A little tip, if you ever, swan, ever want to start an agricultural business, I was told to get the regulations, and having been in the Army and familiar with regulations, I went out and got the regs, and I, the state of Minnesota sent them to me, I read them and read them and read them, and the inspector shows up, and the inspector says, you know what, you're right, but you didn't get all the regulations. So sure enough, we flunked our first inspection, which felt great. And uh, certainly my big takeaway from that was this. That is my big takeaway. So contract production is what we do. So we buy eggs to a brand standard, and then we resell those eggs. And it has been a, a, a hard, hard experience in the terms of we're buying eggs at one price, selling at a different price. But in the world of eggs, it's often a commodity, although our, our eggs are not. So we're always in, in danger of having too many eggs or having not enough eggs. Currently, we don't have enough eggs. It's very, very challenging. It's a brutal, brutal game. Um, Next, I just want to talk about briefly what we're doing at our farm, and then two, more, two or three more slides, and I'll wrap it up. So this is what we're doing at our farm in northern Minnesota. We're popularizing a new berry in the United States called the honeyberry. Uh, we are the first commercial orchard in the country. We have 11 acres or 11,000 plants under cultivation, and it is, uh, as Lucy calls them, uncircumcised penises, which I, I find to be a little, little, little inappropriate for a marketer, but, but true. Uh, not for the public. Sorry, that's I'm um, recording too. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just. <laughs> West Virginia. <laughs> All right. So I uh, I also teach on the side entrepreneurship, and I just wanted to take a little page from that to talk about uh, entrepreneurships. This is a three-hour class that I teach. Um, and um, I wanted, since we're in a military community, I want to talk about a slide or a lesson from my entrepreneurship class, which is this. Is there anyone in the room who can identify this guy and what can he teach us about risk? Yes, sir, that, you are correct. He is a desert fox and he has a lot to teach us about risk. And what is it? Uh, not in this case. He might have, but not for the purposes of, of 
by research. This is what Erwin Rommel said, and I'm paraphrasing the Desert Fox. What is the difference between a risk and a gamble? What is the difference between a risk and a gamble? Because it's an important concept to teach. Yes, both, both are, have odds and both have risk. It's a kind of a long answer, but the long answer is pretty simple. That both gambles and risks have uncertainty, but with a risk, you can return to your original starting position with acceptable losses, but with a gamble, things can spiral out of control. That's what, that was his definition. I think it's true today, especially in the world of agriculture. Uh, my cousin borrows $2 million every single spring to plant 6,500 acres of corn and soybeans. That's gambling. Uh, lastly, my last slide is we are launching a line of frozen custard, hopefully in the late spring. This is an example of what we're doing uh, with our frozen custard line. Value added, yeah. All right. That's it. Yes. Yeah, we have about 500 chickens at our farm. And, but they're, again, then you're also bringing in extra from the outside. Exactly. Okay. So when I'm not saying nasty things about berries, I am. <laughs> um, I I do the marketing with locally laid. So let me see this slide. And locally laid, it kind of sounds a little bit like a naughty website. And um, I just want to assure you that there is nothing about opening a poultry farm that's going to serve as a marital aid. <laughs> and um, it was really very difficult, our starting of the farm. This is Jason's brother, who's now our farm manager. And he said, experience, you just can't Google that. And that is probably the most true statement I can ever come up with with farming, that we thought we knew, we wrote a business plan, we had reread books, we had some sort of mentorship, and none of it really mattered all that much because real life just happens. Um, and you saw this slide before, um, and this slide where the birds literally would not roost, and we, Jason hand roosted them for three weeks wearing a headlamp until one day they remembered that they were poultry. And, um, and these birds were such a train wreck, like they were horrified of prairie, and flies would land on them, which is very embarrassing to chickens. Um, we had gravity water feeders that would not work. And I got to the point, like, gravity will not work on this farm. Um, <laughs> but lots of people will say to me, like, your marketing saved you. Um, to which I really want to say is, well, actually, it's our branding. So there's a subtle difference between marketing and branding. Marketing is all the things we push out into the world. Like if you have a commercial, or if you have a coupon, those are, that's marketing. But what branding does is, I'm sorry, it's like you tell your story in such a way that people want to lean into your, into your company, learn more about you. Because it gives, um, it takes your company and gives it personality and voice and it turns it into its own little entity. Um, it makes it so people emote and actually start caring about your brand. Because it used to be like, if you had a good product out there to sell, it would essentially sell itself. And that's not true anymore. So. If you take your little free notepads and write down to go at home and listen to this 17 minute TED talk, Start With Why by Simon Sinek. Has anyone seen it? Yeah, I base a ton of my marketing off it. So it's well worth it. Um, Cause his big takeaway is people aren't really buying your product. They're buying why you put all this effort into your product. And if you can get people to understand why we are in, like, 
agriculture is such a hard sector to earn a living. I like to say there are easier ways to make no money, but for some reason we get up every day and we keep doing it. And if you can tell people why that is, you're going to get some brand loyalty. And people do business with those who share their beliefs. It's like we take all our brands now and we wear them like NASCAR drivers, like you all have maybe your local coffee shop that you like, um, your, your, your tractor company. People will go to blows over which is the best tractor. So those are things that matter to people. And it's figuring out what's your why for your business. And what makes you different in your category? What are your differentials? Um, and I'm going fast, I know. But differentials matter because it helps you understand who your product is really for and, and what, they, what your customers want you to talk to them about. Now let's get into that a little more. But for Locally Laid, um, we're really about local sourcing and local selling, these small flock sizes. We use non-GMO corn, we plant a tree. Um, this a version of this Subaru actually does exist, although in icy Minnesota, I was going down a steep hill, uh, was hit by an Escalade and turned around and was hit by a Chevrolet. And our insurance adjuster congratulated me for denting all four panels in one rack. And um, our teenager said, could could we maybe not put all those logos back on? So we, we still have the giant chicken on the hood. So, so when, you have, when you understand what makes your product different, so for us it's, it's birds outside on pasture, it helps me understand who I'm selling to. I'm not selling to the value shopper necessarily. I'm selling to people who care about the environment and people who care about animal welfare. And it helps me know what to talk about, particularly when contacting the media. And honest to Pete, you should be contacting the media. And I'm going to go as fast as I can because I do an entire uh, class on this. This is our mission and it takes a long time to write a mission and you guys are working so hard you're probably like why on earth would I take time to write a mission? Um, I wrote this while washing eggs, putting eggs one by one into our Aqua Magic 5, our 1952 uh, refurbished egg washer. And um, I knew we were about real food and, and doing it locally and li taking care of livestock. And, but the reason why it's so important is this tells me, this helps me every day to remember who my customers are. These are my foodies and my animal welfare folks, my local vores, environmentalists, farmies. Do you know what farmies are? People who really, 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 really love farms, so they probably haven't been on one themselves. Um, but we all love those people because they will pay more for a farm-raised product. Go them. Chicken fans. <laughs> Playful consumers, every once in a while I'll get, someone will reach out and they're like, we bought your eggs because we thought the name was sassy, but it turns out they're good eggs. So all these people, when I'm putting together a social media post, if I'm doing a sponsorship buy at an event, I'm thinking, which one of these people are, am I talking to? Because those are my customers and I'm not going to try to get people who are not my customers. It'd just be a waste of time and money. Um, when I, so I take, I take these, uh, those, all those folks on the last slide were my peeps, so I have these animal welfare folks, and if I'm putting something together on Facebook or Instagram, it's kind of a dark photo in this room, but this is a bird uh, in the winter using her uh, free, free choice hay dispenser, and I put that together with a little story of when the weather doesn't cooperate for the girls to play outside. We have things for them to do for indoor recess, this free choice hay dispenser. And it's true, pulling hay keeps them from pulling their sister's feathers. And I put that not cage free, pasture raised, put that up there. And you know, that's some pretty nice engagement. And then people are saying that it also would have stopped the pulling her sister's hair. And so people really engage with that post. But I kind of have this formula of remembering who my people are and what they care about and trying to find a good visual for it. Um, right now, 
Facebook, if you do not pay to boost it, only shows, you, you know, to 3% of your fandom, people who have liked your posts before. So if you're going to play in that world, you probably have to have a small Facebook budget. Um, I always say that don't worry if you don't know what to post on Facebook, it will let you know what's working. And this is true for Instagram and Twitter as well. I put a lot of work creating a, a poultry primer for a few Thanksgivings ago. The idea that if you don't want to talk politics with your in-laws, you can ha to have all these like poultry things that you could bring up with them. I spent so much time on it and like 20 people looked at it. But then I reposted these hot French farmers. <laughs> 23,000 people. So, you know, you're not going to get it right all the time, but they'll make more pixels tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people saw that one. Traditional media, this could be the most important thing that you, you hear uh, from me. Um, it is amazing how important it was, because really, we had so much going on, and I have to say, Traditional media is really more important than we think it is. People are like, oh, it's all digital. You got to be online. And yes, but this is how people see you in traditional media and go find you on digital. They, if they don't know that you're there, they don't know that you're there. So it's just finding, getting these earned media stories, which is a fancy way of saying free news stories. Um, and I, it's fair to say that without the media, we would not be here. Um, we're in the big newspaper uh, in our market in the Twin Cities, a million people in that area. And people just trust a story that they read in the paper way more than your social media posts or any other thing, because it's vetted by a third party. Um, it also has a longer lasting impression this is like a seven-year-old story, and every year someone's like, didn't I just see a big spread about you in the Star Tribune? And I always say, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they last longer. And I'm sure you're going to say, I'm not doing anything that's media worthy. Where we live in Duluth, Minnesota, our newspaper, you know, it's like, it's not a big city, but about 100,000 people read this paper. And one day I went out and I got my paper and above the fold in that section that you hope to read something super important like peace breaks out in the Middle East, there was a full size picture of kittens, of kittens. And I tell you that because Whatever you're doing is as important as kittens. You are not more important than kittens, but you are as important as kittens. <laughs> and your story really matters. And this starts by reading your paper every day. Do you guys get the newspaper? And no. Start reading your paper. Get an online subscription. Read the things that have to do with your market, right, in ag or whatnot. Look at the byline. I used to write for a newspaper, and the only time people ever reached out to me was to tell me how much they loathed what I wrote. So if somebody, if you take the time to read the paper and find your reporters in the, in the sections that make sense, and email them, and actually have something on the subject line that says, loved the story, and the reporter will open it. And you should say, hey, I see that you're writing about farmer's markets. I would love it if we could get together and talk. I would be a great source for you in the future. And it feels like you're online dating, and wow, that's really scary. It's not. You're doing those people a huge service. Um, I just want to close on a funny, funny-ish story. A couple years ago, and you don't bother trying to read this, I got a nasty gram. This guy bought eggs in haste, went home, saw my, that my company was called Locally Laid, and lost his mind. Um, and you know, he added a point. This is our older carton. When we first started out, we were disrupting a market, and we had get locally laid. Um, our tagline is, local chicks are better. Um, <laughs> 
So this guy wrote to me and said that I was personally bringing crudeness into the world, and I was thinking, maybe. Um, he said I was vulgar, and I'm like, do you know me? Yes. Um, but then he started griping about how expensive my product was, and then I got really angry. Um, and I put, put it aside for a while, but then I realized I had to talk to this guy. I had to reach back out. So I wrote him a letter and I acknowledged his point saying, good for you. You didn't like something. You let someone know. I'm thinking you didn't have to be quite so mean about it, but okay. And I put our logo here. This chicken is Lola. She's short for locally, short for laid. Um, and I think she has a personality. She's a friend of mine, which sounds like I should take a rest on a fainting couch. But Lola is a friend of mine, and she lit on my shoulder. And we co-wrote this letter together. She's much sassier and bolder than I am. Um, and we went full frontal farmer on this guy. And we told him about all the labor that goes into making our kind of farming. We talked about food miles. We local source and local source. Sell, whereas most products are going to go further this year than we're going to go on vacation. Um, we, at that time, had planted a bunch of trees. I think we're getting pretty close to 10,000. We started planting trees when we had absolutely no business planting trees. But it was important to us to negate our, our carbon footprint um, that we had small flock sizes. I say we're micro-brewed because I have a lot of time to think up puns. Um, <laughs> You know, talk about the local source. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, and I ended it like, would you have learned all of this if we were named Almonds and Farms? No. Um, and I wrote this all up in an open letter. And Jason's like, oh, honey, that's got a lot of USDA stats, and it's a little wonky. I don't want you to feel bad when nobody reads it. And I'm like, fine. And I put it up anyway, and then we went to go take uh, probably the third mortgage out on our house. And we were doing that, and my phone is buzzing, and my phone is buzzing. And what happened is that it got some movement. This isn't even, this isn't even counting Twitter, but it had well over 1,000 shares. By the time it was done, half a million people had read it. Um, and the very best thing that happened is that it crashed our website. And Jason says, why is this the best thing ever to happen? Because I am like dancing, because I know that I can send out this press release. Chicken breaks internet with open letter. And boy, that's when it got wild. And I ended up on getting all kinds of radio interviews and TV interviews. Um, we sold 500 t-shirts in 10 days. <laughs> and a bunch of different countries. And it was so wonderful. And we got to talk about the problems of middle agriculture, which we alluded to before. So it's pretty exciting. Um, so yes, and we got to talk a long time and one hour on public radio. That was really helpful to our brand. It really pushed it out there. Um, and I do have a book out there. It's called Locally Laid, How We Built a Plucky uh, Industry Changing Egg Farm from Scratch. When you someone buys your book, you don't get to name it. <laughs> um, so that's out in the world. The library will order it for you. You don't have to buy it. But it is out there, and it's very self-effacing, and, and you might not want to go into pastured eggs after it. But at least you'll know what's going on. All right, that's it. Thank you. All right, guys. So my name is Spence, uh, Cross the Creek Farm. Uh, I'm mostly going to hit on pasture broiler production. We also do eggs, but they covered it pretty well. Uh, I also have a podcast. Have you all ever, Fighting Farmer? Has anybody ever listened to that? All good. It's nice to know. It's been a while, I know. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Um, so, anyways, let's get started. So, who we are, this is my wife right here, um, Carla, and uh, we've got a, a, we're the Spencer family. I got kicked off about 2008, uh, I was in the Army, I was one of these guys, did you guys see my question to the USDA, like, why, you know, so it's, uh, that's been true. I went to the VA, and they told me that I'd have to pay, and uh, so the, the farm started on a bad convoy in 2004, 
essentially that I couldn't shake when I got back home. Got a couple hens, kind of the therapeutic stuff that they're starting about. Farm, it turns out farming, I don't care what they say, is a terrible means <laughs> to reduce your stress. <laughs> so, uh, but you know, it's the, it's the path that God had for us. So uh, uh, 30 just kept growing and um, shook all the war stuff and all that without the VA. I got into a good church and had, uh, met some pretty solid dudes that kind of told me to knock it off and help me get to, get to a good place. So now it's just a business. We're primarily broiler based. Uh, we do 11 to 12,000 a year. Um, we're we're kind of looking for land because that can definitely expand. Uh, two years ago, we added a USDA inspected poultry line um, at, with another veteran who had a, a red meat plant. Uh, that was a big deal for a lot of reasons, um, mostly quality, consistency, and just how many of y'all have had someone else process your animals? Okay. It's, it sucks paying money to apologize for someone else's mistakes, right? Um, that doesn't give a crap. And so at least this way, if there's a problem, I can fix it or get really angry at the right person. Um, so uh, we also do some hogs. Um, that, this right here is my oldest boy. They work the summers. At, they started when they were eight in the, on the kill line. <laughs> they make uh, $10 a day and think they're millionaires. So if they want Legos or Pokemon cards, they got money. Um, but you can see we air chill. We came up with these racks. That was kind of one of our custom things. So we're able to integrate right into a red meat plant. If you've ever seen beef hanging or pork, uh, we use the same cooler um, with these racks on their rail system. Uh, we primarily do wholesale, and that's because I have a family. I've got a really good wife. I've got three good kids um, that need attention. And, uh, and we're also big on generational continuance is kind of how we, we talk about it. That's a fancy way to say we want our kids to farm. And uh, my wife grew up on a rice and soybean farm and had a rough childhood because of the farm. And so we're very deliberate. And so farmers markets didn't fit, even though there was a ton of demand because all Saturday, it's like my kid wants to play football. My kids want to play basketball. And, you know, so it's like, what are we going to, how are we going to do? I felt at first it was either or, and then we just found a way where we could do it both. So. Um, we're also getting into wholesale. Uh, we have an online web store. We run a delivery service because of our kids. We're able to pick a delivery date, pack it. There's a, a really, there's a lot of neat services. Barn to doors here, graze cart is what we use. You can go to acrossthecreekfarm.com and kind of see how that rolls. We have over 200,000 in sales a year in chicken. Um, it was more, we cut out some unprofitable stuff where we were making like 5% margin and it was just too much money gonna get the IRS's attention. So like selling, reselling feed, that kind of stuff, it was a lot of problems. So, you know, that's been higher. We've cut it back, it went down, and we're just trying to get more and more profitable, profit margin on what we do. Cause we're, you know, so we're not spinning our wills to make, we wanna make $2 <laughs> instead of a dollar, you know, uh, on each transaction. And then uh, my wife, uh, you can go ahead and hit it. My wife has a good job. You, you know, most American families, both people work. It's pretty typical. Um, I think sometimes working with a lot of beginning farmers, there's this impression that both of you guys should work on the farm and be happy with that. You're two individuals, like someone can have a career and someone can work on farm and everybody has, works three different jobs full time, you know? That, that, that's cool. <laughs> and you should do that to start off instead of going into debt. Uh, but uh, so general broiler flow. We started in this uh, this little ragtag brooder. Um, I didn't know how to use a skill saw when I started farming, and now I can build my own buildings. Uh, and 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 so uh, we built this. We use peat moss, and we're going back to sh uh, shavings. You can see the automatic feed line. Um, instead of feeding chickens three times a day, we put in just a automatic feed line. Um, uh, we run coxie. So, so I'm going to say some stuff. If it goes, if you don't understand, that's okay. So there's like a whole bunch of different levels here. So Josh is a guy who flew out to my farm because he's a pilot to come see it, and he's doing pastured poultry. Um, and some of y'all haven't. So if you have any questions, let me know. But like this is something I would put up there for the Josh or the fighting farmer folks, right? The people that listen to the podcast. We, the, the coxie vaccine. That's a big problem in your brooder. It's a way to avoid antibiotics and um, it's made a huge difference. We've cut our mortality like tenfold in the brooder. Uh, we get chicks as zero day olds from a kind of commercial hatchery that services all the way up to Michigan. We catch the semi 
um, we're big enough to be able to tap into that. So we get them, and they're only hatched like an hour away. So we catch them from day olds. They go in the brooder till they start to feather out or not, just depends on the season. Arkansas is all over the place, hot summers, cold winters. Minus one wind chill last week, that was fun. Uh, then we put them out on pasture. And we, we raise them seven to 10 weeks, depending if we need whole birds, different sizes for different uh, chefs. We, uh, we'll take them all 10, 11 weeks to get uh, ground chicken sausage. We have a whole line of that that we do. Uh, we move them daily, and it is a lot of work. I've got a guy on salary now who's moving them right now, um, or at least should be. <laughs> so we, and then we catch them up after dark, and they go to the processing plant. Thank you. Uh, so we have two styles of housing. This is kind of the newer one. These are We call them hoop coops. Um, Polytech makes one. This is from Featherman, David Schaefer. He, I'm not sure if he still offers a veteran's discount or not, but uh, you know, um, they're great. We put four to 600 birds in there, depending on season. You can see we got the greenhouse plastic. So you know, the other day when it was single digits, it was uh, right about 32 in here. So that was really nice for the birds, kept the wind out. Um, we move this every day. We need a truck or a tractor. Um, Farm hands love this compared to, next slide, this method. <laughs> this is what we originally started off with. These 10 by 12 pins, 70 birds a pin, move daily with a dolly and you're back. So you, you get it up around what God gave you and you, you move it, walk it back. Um, the water system, we have automatic water on everything. You can't haul water and, and, and do chickens commercially. Um, and they drink, their growth rate is directly tied to water. They, it's like a three to one on the volume of water to the amount of feed they eat. So if they don't have water, they're not eating feed, they're not growing, they're not laying eggs. Um, and even if you can't see it, that's where your profits are going. So we have a little dolly that we move. It kind of looks like a, it's a specialized cart. If you, Joel Saladin, it's, it's the one kind of, the style he uses that Joel does. Um, you know, these should be fair weather pins, but we always get caught because of demand and uh, production not having enough land, we have to take it. Like I've got birds out on pasture right now. I've got, so we'll slaughter all the way up to Christmas, early January, which means that we've become like cold weather experts for broiler production and avoiding ascites, that kind of stuff. The, th the big innovation this year is that we get pallet wrap and we wrap these pins. And so that's like our mortality has plummeted. Uh, Cause you know, this, this slobber knocker of a cold spell that hit, I mean, it got everybody, right? Um, Y'all know what I'm talking about last week. I mean, that would have knocked out 20, 30%. I mean, it, it would have been a disaster, I think, out of, we got, we only have about 1,500 out on pasture right now, and I think we lost 12 birds. So, and that's minus one wind chill. We'll see in the next couple days, because of a thing called ascites, but if that interests you, look up the podcast. <laughs> so, uh, so the pros and cons of the housing, labor, these little pins, farmhands hate them. It, it'll get you ripped though. Uh, the, uh, uh, and get you a bad back after 10 years. The, the costs, you know, one of these guys fully decked out by the time you got wire, tart, all the watering systems going to end up costing about nine grand. Um, but you can pay that off within probably about a year and a half, a year. Um, this would be a good thing for like, if your local FSA micro loan guy isn't dumb as a box of rocks, it'd be, this would be a good use for it. So uh, the little guys all decked out, these things are three to 400. Um, and uh, you know, they're, they're great to get started in. Um, it turns out you're, if you kind of look at how long these things last, like we've had these that have lasted eight years, they're still going strong, the originals, which is good for wood and PVC. We just keep replacing parts. Uh, it's, it comes out to about the same cost per bird. Your housing is about 10, 15 cents. That's what your cost per bird is. Uh, you know, pasture poultry is movement. I mean, like, uh, I was president of APA. How many of y'all have heard of APA? Okay, the American Pasture Poultry Producers Association. It's a lot. AAAPA.org. Uh, if you're interested in chickens out on pasture, that's like where you need to go. We've got a conference coming up in, uh, in January in Florida that would be a good farm expense and vacation for your family. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's, I push hard for Florida in, in the winter, or well, she does. Uh, so the, the, the movement, you know, it's, it's got requirements. It's got labor, um, both of these. So these will move easy when we've had 80 inches of rain in Arkansas this year, where our normal is 40. 
we've had problems getting these hauled without tearing up the pasture. So, um, especially in the winter months, because it doesn't dry out. But what we do is we spread hay, which we cut from this pasture. And then it actually, after a day, you start getting a composting action and it heats the, the pen, which is pretty cool. Um, and then, uh, you know, the bird environments are different. So um, this one is a more stable environment. Um, it's more forgiving for hot or cold. These ones you really have to kind of micromanage. Um, and then uh, for heat, we have more problems in these and there. And then in the cold, we have more problems in these small ones than the big ones. So uh, next slide. You the heat, the bigger ones are better? Yeah, they give a bigger shade and you can put a misting system easier in them, just stuff you find at Lowe's. Predators, uh, I'll cover that here in a little bit, but yeah, they're an issue. <laughs> Not as much, uh, we, we don't have, it'll be like Ralph, the, the raccoon. You, you know, it's like there's 100 raccoons, there's one that kills $1,000 worth of chickens. So, um, so you, this, the monitor, projector's not good, but this is a kind of a burnt out, you can see. But this is the day before. You can't really see it because of the projector quality. But I don't know if you guys can see that brown stain. Looks like one of my kids, tidy whities <laughs> And it, it uh, but you know, you go from there and and it recovers like within a day. It's amazing. So um, and the, the and one of the things we've had to transition into is now apparently. And Josh helped me because he came in right at this when I was overwhelmed with this problem. We have this thing called Johnson grass, which has decided Arkansas is its new home. And Johnson grass loves fertility, which means it loves my farm. And so over the past, this, this field was originally red dirt because it had been eroded and all that. And six years later, I've got like Johnson grass 13 foot tall. I'm on the tractor and it's taller than the tractor. Um, and so like we, we cut hay now. And it's, you know, when you think we have a, a two, about two and a half pounds of feed into one of our broiler produces one pound of chicken. Well, that other pound and a half, where's it go? It goes here. And so this is a way of recouping that, that initial investment. So we, every three weeks, we get about seven to $8,000 worth of feed. So you think 4,000 of that turns into chicken, that other 4,000 or so is out the back. I'm, the math is a little fuzzy on that because I'm doing it on the fly, but it goes out the back. Well, this is a way to capture that. So um, it's something we're kind of getting new in. And, and Pete, man, it, when I do the hay right and don't screw it up because we're doing square bales, Man, it's some amazingly rich stuff, so uh, really high quality. All right, next. All right, so wholesale markets, uh, they're the majority of our sales. They're strongly relationship driven. So while we were up here, I was texting chefs, um, uh, you know, finding out their orders for when we get home. Um, and I mean, we're, you have to, like Benny Keith, Cisco, whatever your whoever is, um, our chefs are fiercely loyal to us. I've had chefs I've delivered chicken, a case of chicken to every week, the right size for going on a decade. So um, I've had chefs where we've had these big, like, like Heifer had this big, uh, has this big thing and you know, they tried to take some of our markets, this cooperative, they sent in marketing people and one of our chefs had an across the creek farm shirt under his chef's coat and they wouldn't s stop asking him. So he finally like supermaned them. He's like, we're sticking with Spence. <laughs> He's like, bam. And, and that sent the message. And uh, so you really like kind of what she said, you're selling yourself. They see our kids, you, you know, and, and we've been around for a long time. Um, but, you know, most of it, though, is quality. So this guy is a three time semifinalist for the James Beard Award, best chef in the South. If you know that kind of stuff, they take our stuff up to New York with them. Uh, we supply a lot of like high, high end stuff. Um, because of our prices, right? And we're, that's why our wholesale works. You know, some areas of the country that won't, you know, you know it's gonna be unique to everybody. Uh, we sell whole birds primarily to our wholesale accounts uh, and we run half pound increments. So this guy, I say half pound, he actually gets between a three and really a 3.5 pound bird. So I, have, I do I spend a day a week sorting the chickens we process and packaging them and casing them in the right cases so that that guy, because he runs on a budget and he's got spreadsheets of how much he makes. And when he orders from Tyson or whoever else, he gets six pound and three pound birds mixed in a case because it's too much to sort it. So now the good thing is I can eventually hire someone at, you know, 
11 bucks an hour, 12 bucks an hour, because we're in Arkansas to sort birds for me. You know, you, you know, but that's like a really critical step is always give him what he wants. Uh, you know, and, and wholesale allows you to really scale up quick. And what that's done is it gives us a good basis for retail. Because I always have what people need because I have to have so much volume. Say always, we're getting, we've had so much business this fall. It's kind of wiped us out. Um, the good thing about wholesale too, it's a good outlet for things that you can't sell, like wings. So I sell to a double tree in Benton, Arkansas, the Walmart capital. They, they buy all of our wings. So like we were looking at the menu last night and we put it all, I was like, hey, double tree in Arkansas buys our wings. Uh, yeah, you know, so uh, the, you know, we have places that take cases of breast. We have places that take cases of thighs or we've, we just supply a private school. Um, it's for where all the Walmart kids go. That's why it's able to afford our chicken. But it's, uh, uh, <laughs> but you know, they're like, what do you, I don't have that, but I have this. Okay, well we can use that. So I've got some flexible customers. I've got customers that pull chicken, so they don't care if the carcass is missing a wing or a leg. It, it, they prefer it actually missing a wing. But I can't send this guy that, because he's doing a half plate of chicken. So, you know, it's a big puzzle. To, as you grow larger, you gotta have, it's like a puzzle where all the pieces have to fit, because if this piece is left out, this piece is worth $5,000 a year of product. On drums, you know, we, uh, we, we take our birds real big, and then I bone them out by hand, and you know, I mean, at, I get three three pounds of sausage for a really big bird, um, and then I get ten dollars a pound, so that chicken's worth thirty dollars, you know, net. And so even, and I get a pretty, and we clear probably about eight dollars on those real good big guys. So, um, but for stuff like my drums, if I just bone out drums, there's only forty percent of the drum is is meat depending on how big it is. So I don't make a lot of money doing that, but I also not sitting on a bunch of drums because I've got that drums is, t uh, I've got money tied up in it. So by boning it out and running it through, even if I break even, I'm not sitting on literally frozen assets that I can't use. And I'm not taking the risk of frostbite or fro, what is it? Freezer burn. Freezer burn. Thank you, Josh. Uh, it's the Arkansas West Virginia Education System team, tag team in it. Uh, we go. There you go. <laughs> so uh, uh, you know, so that way it's, I don't have to throw that away. So um, you want to have as many, and it's it's a pain to keep track of. But the 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 more like these are all like fail safes that we've built in the business. This is what half a ton of boned out chicken looks like for the week. Uh, plant producers or plant employees don't like that. Um, we also grind in hearts. So you think like hearts, you don't sell them, right? Well, you can grind in 5% heart. You take something that sells for $3 a pound and now it's worth $10 a pound. So when you make your sausages, you, you buy ginger at $4 a pound, you grind it. Well, now you turn it into $10 a pound. That's the beauty of chicken sausage or any sausage, whatever ingredient you take. <laughs> as, as long as it's less than $10 a pound, you're, you're making money on it. So, st so stuff like onion, garlic, all that stuff. Other, so your spices you gotta watch out for. So it's a way, of, I mean, it's like taking, it's like alchemy, right? You're taking something and turning it into something more valuable. Um, you know, a big reason for our USDA line, like I mentioned, are the chefs, or is this guy, Matt, um, who just texted me. <laughs> but it's like, they want quality. Like, they can't have crappily done birds. And, and so we give them what they want. Uh, we also scald and scrape hogs. We do some stuff like that, um, and that's been a really, really good thing. You know, I get 285 a pound hanging weight for my, for my hogs that eat mostly acorns, but I'm also the only one that'll deliver a 250 pound hanging weight hog to a restaurant, cut in half, head on, paws on. Part of that is because I've got access to the right processor, and the only reason they do that is because I had enough chicken volume that said, hey, my customers want this, and they took the risk on the $40,000 hog scalder. So, and this is all like a process of 10 years, you, you know, of building it up. So, uh, you know, uh, we're starting to get into holes, cuts, and sausage. I make an amazing chicken chorizo. Uh, my, my Hispanic employees tell me that. They're like, it's really good. Uh, so, uh, you know, the packet, if you go to the processor and he makes you chorizo, it's a packet about this big. Mine's, uh, uh, two thirds of a five gallon bucket full of spices. So that, that's gonna taste different, it's gonna be radically different. The whole plant smells like cinnamon and allspice whenever we gr uh, grind our sausage, which is amazing. Uh, so 
the the whole the retail um, we have the online graze cart that's kind of been going well. Wouldn't you say, Carla? Carla says yes. Uh, we it's really seasonal demand. So like so we're in whole bird season now. In the summer, people don't want whole bird. They want a lot of wings. They want thighs. They want you know they want stuff to grill. Um, we do cuts. The big thing when you cut up a chicken is you have to find a home for everything, which I kind of talked about. You know, so when you cut up a chicken, you'll get thighs, you'll get wings, you'll get drums, you'll get a boneless skinless breast or skin on breast, you get tenders, you get the frames. Well, what do you do with that frame? You know, because if you can sell it at a dollar a pound and you run 11,000 chickens, a frame is typically on average about a pound and a quarter. That's over $10,000 a year. If you have to throw that frame away, which if you've done chickens at some point, you don't have storage, you don't have the market, you know, and that's like where your, your family, like not just subsisting, but thriving, that's the kind of stuff it's at is on these margins. Stuff like turning that heart into $10 a pound. Um, skin, I've got chefs that'll buy skin. Yeah, yeah you know, like, so we, we'll pull that off or we'll take that skin off that frame at a dollar a pound, use it to boost our fat up content in our chicken sausage, and now it's 10 times more valuable. Uh, livers, kind of same deal. Um, cuts like wings and drums are the ones that you're going to get bogged down on. Wings are great to ship to restaurants because at two ninety five a pound, I'm actually competitive with Tyson, which is crazy. Like, I mean, it, that's like crazy to me. And we're right next to Tyson head, World Headquarters. Um, so, uh, you know, grinding. We've talked about that. Um, this is the size of chicken. You know, an eleven pound live weight chicken broiler. Um, we call them Carl anytime they're that big, but, uh, you know, that's, that's what we're, we're doing. The flip side on those big birds is if they die, you got a lot of money tied into them. And when it comes to the, the, the high heat, high humidity, they have problems and I'm not going to get into all of it, but ask a question and I'll do it on the, the, the podcast. <laughs> so, uh, so t these are kind of some of the takeaways if you're kind of getting in or you're interested in it. It's easy in. The big thing about pasture poultry is cash flow. You can get started. Josh can tell you um, uh, that can be good or bad because you can you can ramp up really fast and get yourself into a lot of trouble. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's Josh's wife. <laughs> uh, you know, so when it when it comes to it, slow is wise, fast is foolish. Um, if you if you do like a batch of a hundred and you can't find a market for it or something, you'll learn mistakes. Uh, the same thing that'll kill 100 chickens is the same thing that'll kill 10,000 chickens, mistake-wise. So you can learn your lesson on 50 chickens and be a lot cheaper than if you started off 1,000. Um, and what I found is it's kind of like you got to know your stuff. You got you to be the right person to do it because lots of people are going to start and fail. So never worry. Like we've never worried about can people overproduce us. I got the guy from Blue Apron. Have you ever heard them? They're, they moved in and he's tried to take my market. You know, you know, he's got some big project and the relationships and the, honestly, the expertise of doing something for 10 years. I mean, I'm like, go ahead, dude, <laughs> try it. Uh, you, you know, so uh, processing is going to be your choke point, though. I, was, I think he's going to talk about that. Like, figure out where your processor is before you start that before you order a chicken, figure out what you're going to do. There are lots of smiles, lots of head nods uh, from up here. That's your choke point. Um, I'm in Northwest Arkansas, and I'll process for, process for you if you can get them. Uh, the high labor input, you know, you know I see some gray. <laughs> I see some broke backs, too, from, from the military. Um, the Air Force guys are cool. But uh, <laughs> Coast Guard's over there. He's ready to get at, get, do some work. But they, I'm just joking. They, uh, uh, you know, like, it is a lot of labor. Um, and that's something, you know, the kids were rapidly looking forward to that point when they can add that, that shot of energy into it. Um, you know, you, you do compete against a cheap chicken mindset, and so you just gotta price your stuff for what it is. You gotta know what it costs. You can't look at what other stuff costs because that'll drive you out of business. So um, we're right in the middle of Tyson, Simmons, George's, uh, Ozark Mountain Poultry. I mean, you, you know, we, we're right there. My kids go to school five minutes away from Tyson World Headquarters. It's huge, <laughs> you, you know? But I got Tyson employees that buy my chicken. You, you, you know, it's like, <laughs> uh, you, you know, it's just, it, it's just a different animal. And then they go to restaurants, they see us. And that's one thing, like, that there's a lot of value in being 
like every year you're around, it builds trust, which she kind of talked about, you know, just being stable, being slow, like there's a lot of things that come. The longer you're in business, the harder it is to go out, um, unless you're a dummy. Uh, and so, you know, there's also a lot of greenwashing of pasture. This is something uh, that we that we face APA as an organization. Uh, go to a store, it's labeled pasture raised. Those birds have never been outside. You, you, you know, I mean, like, that's something Mr. Vermont here would face, you know, like he's got winter, you, you know, like, and uh, so pasture poultry is movement. If they're not moving, uh, yeah, you know, um, and then the, uh, and I'll say one other thing, since they covered the, the stuff, uh, we buy pullets. We, we go all the way up to New Jersey or Pennsylvania to pick them up, haul them back, and, and we kind of have a pullet thing. So if that's something in your area, I know Seven Sons, I think they do that too up around Indiana. You guys were talking about pullets and that, but I think last year I got them for about 650 beak on, non-GMO, all that jazz. I work a lot with Fur Trail, if you've ever heard with them. Jeff's like my, my buddy. Jeff Maddox, who, who's like the brains behind that, he's the old Air Force vet and he's a funny guy. And the big thing is you gotta love it. I mean, it's like coming down here was stressful um, and it's just, it's every day. And it's just, you know, you gotta carve a life within it and keep it separate, but you gotta love what you do. Um, Cause you gotta be the expert and it's hard, but I mean, we're all used to challenges. And if you wanna do it, you just you figure out a way, so. And that is, my talk to you. What do you want to do now, Mark? Okay. Yeah, same question. I know some of you guys have questions. We'll just do that at the end, right, Mark? All right, so my name's Anthony Brewer. So my wife and I own Brewer's Family Farm in Nebraska. And uh, thankfully, you guys, I was a last minute ad, so I don't have slides. So uh, we'll actually uh, try to make this a little shorter because I know the key thing is I'm sure everybody's got a ton of questions because I know we had a ton of questions and really didn't have anybody to ask those questions to. So in this kind of environment, in this kind of place, this is huge being able to ask people who've, who've done it a day longer than you or a year longer or decades longer than you and try to get a little bit ahead. Obviously, that doesn't, doesn't go across everything and everything doesn't translate to where you are or what you're doing. Uh, but being able to have a little bit of information to kind of move forward and at least for thought uh, definitely helps. Uh, so a little background. So we're actually uh, just north of Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, so we raise uh, beef, pork. Uh, we have uh, raw goat's milk. We do pastured poultry. So we have roughly 850 laying hens uh, that we sell in five grocery stores within Omaha, uh, Nebraska. Uh, within our area, our demand for broiler chickens is actually not very high. Uh, but for like turkeys is very high. So we do primarily eggs and turkeys. We do do three iterations of broiler chickens uh, a year, just a lot of it because of weather. Uh, so just uh, as he mentioned, keeping them moving, that's about it being on the pasture. Um, during the winters in Nebraska, it's usually just so bitterly cold, especially this past winter with that polar vo vortex. Uh, it's just way too cold. Uh, for us to keep our chickens out on pasture during the winter. So we've just decided, and the fact that the demand isn't as high, we've chosen it's a seasonal thing. So we'll start them uh, in the spring, um, usually a couple weeks before when we know it's gonna be kind of warm enough to get them out there. And then we'll close up before, you know, by the last frost. So really Halloween-ish, uh, our last uh, broilers are coming off the pasture. Um, but we definitely rotate them, tractors, uh, key, is you gotta keep them moving to keep them on, on good green grass because that cuts down your feed costs. But on the other side of it is remember, they, they eat a lot, but it's gotta come out just like he mentioned. And it will burn your pasture if you keep it on there too long. So it's, it's really just kind of managing that and trying to build those efficiencies. I know for us, we're rebuilding our tractors yet again uh, going in this next year to make it more easily to move, make them a little bit lighter. Um, so we've, we've actually, uh, Homegrown our own employees, so we have eight children. Uh, so our our six uh, six boys, which are the oldest, are basically our manual labor, uh, what I like to call them. Um, but those monsters, they kind of uh, they do a lot of the work. So trying to build those efficiencies as we're doing the farm, uh, so we spend less time moving animals, uh, helps cut down on some of those overall costs. Um, but yeah, so we basically do that. So some of the, one of the huge challenges that we're actually dealing with. Uh, going into this next year, uh, which is our winter project, because um, as you'll find out in farming, there's always something else to plan for. And then 
really there's always something you didn't plan for that you thought you were planned for, and then you get hit, say like the polar vortex that takes out 300 of your laying hens right before the season starts when you're, the rest of your, a lot of your stores are really kicking in. Um, so that makes it fun. But, uh, so one really huge thing we've got to deal with is, so in Nebraska, the very last USDA inspected poultry uh, processor just shut down. Uh, so this was, they finally said, that's enough. Our, our uh, profit margin isn't enough to do poultry because uh, most of them do both poultry and red meat in the same facility. Uh, but in Nebraska, in order for them to do poultry, they have to completely shut down their operation, clean it, prep it for poultry, do the poultry processing, which is basically one day a week, completely clean it, get it reinspected so they can then continue on with red meat the rest of the week. Uh, so in their defense, it just was not profitable for them to continue doing poultry processing. So obviously for the rest of us, it's kind of tough because now where do you take it? Um, so obviously alternative is one thing we're looking at. Right, we can, we can now take it to Arkansas. Um, it's only, or Kansas, right. So basically three hour or a six hour drive uh, with broiler chickens, which it could be interesting. Obviously the alternative is we do it ourselves. So we did our first trial run this fall, borrowed some equipment, said, all right, how, how efficient can we do this? Can we do it? Uh, we've done it very small scale, um, but this was kind of, all right, can we, how long does it take us to run 200 chickens through the process from start to finish? Is it worth it? Um, yeah, so it, it was fun. Um, yeah, so obviously this winter, that's our project for the winter is, is how do we move forward? How do we look at uh, processing ourselves? Now from the other perspective is an expense is actually having somebody else process it. So if you're now able to do it internally, if you're able to build those efficiencies, and have, obviously as, as veterans, we understand how to plan. So how do, we, how do we work through that and develop that plan so we go into it and it's efficient, we're able to do it, we do, do it effectively, and provide that optimum, that best product to our customers. Because obviously we want to make sure that's the best product that they get so that they not only return to you for that chicken or poultry product, but they come back for beef or pork or anything else. Uh, so that's obviously our big project uh, for this winter is trying to figure out how do we do the processing. So the other side of our farm is, which my wife loves because she's, she's uh, educated in uh, education, uh, which is great. Uh, so she loves teaching. Uh, so our other farm really focuses on educational programs. So just like you'll learn from all the rest of the farmers is you can, you can whatever you decide to do is how much money can you make doing the same thing? So whether it's chicken, what's that next thing you can make from them? If it's selling their feed or it's selling their feet for dog treats or whatever it might be. In our case, it was education. So within Omaha, there's a huge demand for people wanting to learn about farming. Uh, there's a lot of schools that are bring out. We do a lot of field trips with kids uh, that love bottle feeding our baby goats. So the kids think it's hilarious that somebody wants to pay money to do their chores, but <laughs> if somebody's willing to pay money to do their chores, by all means, you're more than welcome. Bring your bus, we will let you do our chores uh, and pay. So one, one really great educational program we've, we've actually started and been doing it for about five years now, it's a program called Rent-A-Chick. So every spring, which when we were stationed in California, so I'm still active duty Army, uh, but when we were in California, uh, for Easter, everybody likes going to Track Supply and they buy their chicks at Track Supply and they're great because they're cute and they're cuddly. And then about two weeks later, they start getting their adult feathers and now they're ugly. Now they're like, oh, what do we do with these things? So in California, we'd see them at animal shelters. We'd find them on the side of the road. I mean, it was just amazing. We're like, geez, there's got to be a better way. Uh, so we started a rent-a-chick program. So for Easter, every year, um, we basically have farming families who we, we basically get our new incoming laying hens as chicks. Well, as another way to make money, we people rent these two chicks for two weeks, and then we provide all the feed, we provide a place for them to be, they're everything for two weeks, they get a class, they get to enjoy, they're basically the kids, and we do have some adults that do it, um, but they basically will rent a chick or a pair of chicks for two weeks and take care of them, enjoy, kind of be part of a farm. Um, and then that basically pays for our chicks. So every year when we get our new batch of laying hens as chicks, 
those, that rent a chick program is not only paid for our new laying hens, uh, but it's actually providing an additional profit uh, for our laying hen operation. Uh, so it's a great program. We get a lot of kids. We even have some um, adults uh, who don't have kids who think they're the kids. So they actually bring them back and take pictures of them and they're on Facebook and it's pretty neat. Um, and those are, for all intents and purposes, are kids, which is kind of strange, uh, but uh, they do do that. So finding different ways to kind of make money off of whatever venture you're deciding to do is key. Um, and I, I don't know if there's too much more. I mean, I'm sure we probably want to get into questions. We've got about 20 minutes left. Um, uh, so I was stationed at Offutt Air Force Base. Now I'm down at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, which makes it fun, too, because now I get to work Monday through Friday in Fort Leavenworth, drive three and a half hours on Friday, work the farm Saturday and Sunday, and then drive home at 4 a.m. Monday morning. And, and I've only missed two weekends in a year and a half. So, and that's because of duty. So it's, it's great time. But uh, <laughs> oh, we love the farm, but more importantly, we love the relationships and working with the customers. Uh, whether it's in, in selling the beef or the farmer's markets or the educational programs. That's, I mean, that's really what, like you said, I mean, you've got to love what you're doing um, because, yeah, you're definitely not going to get rich farming. Uh, but where you will get rich is in those relationships, both with your customer and other, with other farmers. So whether it's other veteran farmers or whatever it might be, uh, that's kind of where you're getting a lot more out of it than, than money. So even though money is good. Yes, ma'am. Do you ever have any concerns or issues with biosecurity with like the chip program or the field trips coming on the property? Uh, no. So we've actually um, redid some of our, uh, our facilities. Uh, so within our laying uh, operation, that's actually, we have it separated to where you actually now, via an FVC uh, fellowship fund, uh, we actually redid our facility with our laying hens to where they actually walk in and it's basically all clear. Um, so they don't actually step within the laying hen facility uh, where they go and they still go and spend most of their time out. They can go walk in the pastures. Uh, if they're out in the tractors, they're out in the tractors. Uh, but we haven't had any issue. We do do, like I said, the smaller facility just so people can see it. Um, but we have not had any issues with biosecurity, no. We have. We have. We have. <clears throat> Right. Do you have any issues with that? So we don't. So basically those chicks will end up, so those get separated. So the rented chick chicks, they'll actually be, uh, when we get them in, they're completely separate from the flock in a different part of the farm. Uh, they do the program, they come back to that side of the farm, and they'll actually stay in that farm until they're uh, probably, I don't know, about three to four months. So they, they won't even interact with the rest of the flock until they're at least three to four months old. Right, by then, right, if anything's come up, which, I mean, in the course of five years, I think we've only lost a dozen chicks. And that was because of, of the people, not because of the chicken. <laughs> <clears throat> Right, so it's, we started off originally where we, we just provided a clear tote, and then we found out, right, it was a little difficult, because it's, with chicks, they obviously need controlled temperature as well, so it's the heaters. Uh, so what we found out is, if we provide an entire kit, so basically they will get a clear tote, uh, it's got a cover with a uh, wire on it, so kids can't reach in and grab them, of course, uh, but it does come with a feeder, a water, a heater, uh, it comes with puppy pads uh, to actually put down. Uh, they get a class on uh, safety, both from, you know, wash your hands, take care of the chicks, how to hold the chicks. Uh, so we've actually found that we can actually provide the entire thing, uh, obviously now at an increased rate to be able to cover everything, and people are more than willing to pay it.
Right, and we still we still get that. We don't get that as much now. Um, now that we've actually been doing it for a while, um, we've actually had some interest in Colorado, uh, Colorado, Wisconsin, and Minnesota uh, that actually want to start a similar type program uh, within those states. So um, it's actually pretty neat. The the key thing is what we really focus on in the class is is safety, both with how do you care for the chick properly, but also just the hygiene of being able to interact with the kids. Uh, but we try to make it fun. They post pictures. We, we have contests of, you know, your name. So you submit, hey, what were your names of your chicks? And then we'll put it out to Facebook. And, you know, the people will get to vote on some of the, you know, their names. And then, you know, in a year later, we'll post pictures of, hey, here's the chicks from the rent chick program. You know, and, and some, a lot of the kids will come out for trips that did the rent a chick And they, they swear they can pick out their chicks. So it's kind of interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. What acreage over birds managed do you guys typically get about a ratio of how many birds per acre of uh, So I, I'm, I'll let them answer too as well. But like for us, we have our farm total is 70 acres, and right now we have the 850 chickens run on about 30 acres right now, but in tractors following the cows around the pasture. So in smaller groups. The answer to that is like, that's, a, that's like super common question, and it's really frustrating because there's no answer to it. Because <laughs> of, yeah, and that's the thing, like, are you talking about, are you talking about Nebraska dryland pasture? Are you talking about, you know, you know like rainfall and all that? It, it's, so that, like, that's, that's what you gotta look, are you talking about laying chickens? Because they'll moonscape an area in about two days. Are you talking about broilers? So it's, that's really like a, a location specific. The big thing is if you plan, what you can do is figure out moving them every day. Um, and, and so like if you had, like say that, that 40 by 20, we put 500 chickens in that, you know, that's like five and a quarter or one and a quarter square foot per bird per day. And then you could map that out and then figure out will the grass recover? Do I have enough rain? And really it's a lot of it's rainfall or irrigation based. So. I know that's really not helpful, but <laughs> yeah. 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 Yep. Yeah. What do you do? Yeah. And that's why, like, when you when you guys are looking for information, if you ever find someone, like sometimes you'll read publications, they'll tell you, do this, this is the answer. Like, back up, <laughs> and we'll go somewhere else, because, you know, like you should always hear, it depends, like, on a lot of stuff like that. Yeah, Mark, yeah, okay. Yeah, hey, go ahead. Hey, I, I got a question uh, from Luckily Late. Um, my wife and I own a store called Farmhouse Casuals, because what we had found out is that we, we simply can't meet the demand. Uh, at, the, at the current time, because of my jobs taking me off a lot, whatever, that's, that's not my point. <clears throat> my point is, we have allowed some other farmers that farm regeneratively like we do, that we have no problem putting our name behind, mm -hmm. to start selling their products in my store. My question to you is, how have you made sure that the Amish that you're getting your uh, products from are practicing um, acceptable standards that you would put your name behind? Um, it's a good question. So what we do, we start with contracts, and then we have unannounced site visits, and those are kind of the, the two key things. And then we have one farmer that's not Amish, and we, I just tell you, take, a, take a video of the pasture, so you can see where it's, if it's been rotated or not, and you can see if the chickens have been eating the grass or not. So the contract says come visit at any time. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Question. Um, this is for Spencer. So I do, uh, well, I want to do like um, farm to urban setting, but do broiler chickens to the restaurants mm -hmm. in the food area. Yeah. And do I need to, like, processing? How, how do they, do they accept just fresh meat only at the restaurant? So how would you, do you have to process every week for them to have fresh birds? 
Yeah. Yeah. So you, the way we do it is we run, uh, we just, they're just, when you buy chicks, it's called straight run. And so, uh, we run them straight run and then depending on what we need, we're always like sorting. So we go in and we'll catch up half the flock typically. And those will be whole, you know, and there's some variation on what sizes we need for cuts and that, but you, you can order enough for, you could do three weeks worth, you know, you know, like where you're at week seven, week eight and week nine. And the first ones are like your whole birds, you know, and it, it, you're going to have to play around with it. Um, but the, the big thing being in an urban environment are, you know, it depends on how urban, you know, so you're going to need acreage. And then the problem that we even run into out where we're at, because it's growing up around us, we're one of the fastest growing parts of the country. Um, and it's, we, you know, anytime there's a dead deer, somebody says it's the chicken farm, you, you know, like, uh, so it's, the, you're going to have some serious opposition to that, depending on how urban it is, you know. Um, but, you know, I've, all those chefs, they're like James Beer. I mean, they're like top chefs in the country. They write books and that, they take Frozen. So, uh, and, and what I've learned are the chefs that, that only take fresh, they are pains in the butt to deal with. So especially like in an urban environment where you're gonna have a ton of other things, man, I just find someone that believes in what you do and works with you. Because in Cleveland, I mean, you will have no problem. Yeah, I mean, the restaurant yeah. really big, really big out of the, you know, Yeah, yeah, and, and don't, you know, like the easiest, like pick one, or, try to find one or two that you think will treat you right. Try to find people that like you'd hang out with normally. And uh, I mean, cause like, yeah, I mean, like the values are, that's important to build that relationship, you know, and then just kind of ease into it. And uh, if you can find people that take the whole bird, like especially they pull for chicken salad, barbecue, that kind of stuff, if they can be flexible on that, that'd be a good place to start. Yeah, you had a question? The purpose, you know, the DEQ, how is that, in the long run, because I know that there's, a, you know, the big issue. Oklahoma. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, how poultry is polluting the, the ground yeah. and stuff like that. Have y'all incurred any, uh, uh, any issues? No. So this, he's in my, like, Oklahoma. They, they blame, they blame our chicken poop and going in their river in the Illinois. But, uh, yeah, so we, the way we do it, no, you saw that picture. I mean, it's gone. You can look and, like, in seven days, the grass is recovered and super lush. The, the way the poultry industry in, in our neck of the woods happens is they're, they're spreading litter a lot of times in winter, and then it, it washes off, or there's a soil erosion that gets into the stream, and that's what's causing the problem. So we don't have a problem. Um, because you're not chicken houses, you're not a point source of pollution. You're kind of like, that's how the, AD, or the EPA would file it, or probably the O A D E whatever the Oklahoma version is of that. Yeah. So, um, I, I know, talk to me offline. Like I, I process for some Oklahoma processors, but they've never had a problem. So it won't be a problem unless you, just don't take them right up next to the Creek. Just to add in, I just follow up with just ensuring you're, you're moving them. Yeah. So just like he said is the more you move them, the you'd never even know they were there a couple of days later. But except for the fact that your grass is taller, it's greener. I mean, it's it's amazing the difference it makes. We understand that. I mean, recovery of any livestock or anything like that, you know, from pasture rotation and stuff like that. But getting in three out of one stuff, understand that you're going to have to move it up to the But the, and the big thing with the, looking at like for you cattle guys and that the 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 rotation, you know, if you mob graze. And that kind of stuff, uh, you know, like that's good. The difference with chickens is that you're actually, when you think about it, and I don't know how this factors in sustainably, you're you're pulling nutrients. So I'm getting folks nutrients from the Delta in Arkansas or Kansas, uh, where my soybean meal comes from. I'm exporting nutrients and I'm bringing it and fertilizing my farm with it. So like, and especially your soils are the same. You, you, you know, like that's why chickens, our soil type, the ultasols. I was a soil scientist, but they, uh, it, it, it will cause like, that's what our soils need are just the nutrients. And the most bioavailable form of that is like when it comes straight out of the bird.
Mm -hmm. uh, and we might do Merix. I think typically we, yeah, we might do Merix. The Coxy is over time. Um, the the broiler chickens are just really susceptible to it, um, but they can talk. I I've, I've never the only the the ones that you'll have problems with just on a national level. Like when when he was talking, there's two that you can look up. There, it's called MS or MG, but Mycoplasm synovia or Galaseptacum, those are like the bane of all chickens, and they're super contagious. They're kind of weeny uh, microbes. Um, I won't go super far into it, but if you've ever looked and you have a bunch of birds that have one lame leg and they're on the side, or if you hear the and, and then they have like the watery, like a watery eye or something, you probably have a, a mycoplasm. It'll knock about 10% to 20% of your production. In broilers, it's about 10% mortality. Um, there's not really much you can do on either of it once it's in there, um, except just have a period where you clean out. So be rotating out, like we take pullets, we take them about a year and a half, and then we sell them to people, because they're still laying, we do red sex links, then we bring new pullets in. Like the thing that gets, gets you bio, uh, for biosecurity wise is to take, have something that like hens that are three, four years old on your farm, because they've collected every disease and they're immune to it and they're infecting everybody with it, and that's the case for them. Broilers, I mean, it's in and out, in and out, in and out. And so like we'll come to in December, we won't have any more broilers but the layers are kind of the ones we've had problems with. And so like turkeys, that's where you'll see a lot of this. Like if you want to know where your poultry systems suck, it's when you try to do turkeys and they all die. Uh, yeah, I know Josh. So uh, yeah, you know, so um, that we're actually looking at for our turkey production, we almost had a parcel of 17 acres we were just going to do exclusively turkeys and broilers on um, and keep the layers off, so. Uh, just quickly on that vaccination question for laying hens, um, to my knowledge, and I could be wrong, uh, there's no requirement to vaccinate for salmonella. It's not required. When we just looked for a place to get the birds, we only go with people that vaccinate for salmonella, and it's a three-step process. So. So if you run through, if you go talk to... You guys, the government people, it's going to run you about at least half a million. So if you come to our plant on one of the FEC tours or the APA tours, you'll see where we did it for about 60000 So um, we've got some really, uh, my partner who owned the red meat plant, so it was a red meat plant and then we added on. And you all ever seen the, like the carport, you know, those metal buildings? We do that, we frame, you know, like when you look at a, if you're not familiar with construction, when they frame it, it's like a, just the, the wall and then the boards run, the two by fours run like that. Well, we run two by sixes like this. So not like that, where they're perpendicular, but parallel. And then we spray foam in between. And that's how we do freezers or coolers. If you wanna make a dirt cheap cooler for eggs, I mean, it, it'll be about a quarter of the cost of those big locking panels. Um, you get a real good seal on it. And uh, you can do that with a floor, a concrete floor, drain, septic system maybe or whatever you got to do there that's depending on your state hook it up to the sewer if you can and uh, and you can get rolling and then you got to put your refrigeration system in we have a rail stuff so you can do it much cheaper um, if you're not reinventing the wheel uh, the problem with poultry only processing poultry and this is what i was telling uh, anthony here is like that thing you're going to pay that money for that facility and that facility is not operating, you're, 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 you're not making money on your investment, you're probably losing it, right? So one thing that works really well is how many of y'all are in areas that do a lot of deer hunting? Just about everybody, right? You could pay for the cost of that facility. If you, if you look into it, or just look into this, potentially paying for the cost of that facility, deer processing is like the Wild West. <laughs> I mean, if you wash your hands, you're doing good in some of these places, you know? like. <laughs> But people pay a ton of money, and you can learn how to process a deer, and if you actually give a crap, you can do it better than 90% of people. But you, you, know, you charge 90 to 100 bucks a deer, it takes you not that much money, uh, you, you know, and you could do a custom deer processing facility, 
during hunting season. Um, and you, you know, you have to do some groundwork. And I know our plant pays off like almost all of its expenses for the year running, doing deer processing. So uh, we shut down, we don't do anything. Um, yeah, and then you could have, then you're set up to do, especially the way I just described it, you could do something there, have a cooler where you hang it, cut it up, get some vacuum systems. Um, if your marriage gets into trouble because of this idea, it's not my fault. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, but so there's examples like that to kind of like, how are you gonna extend that? Um, you can do things like rabbits. Uh, you, rabbit and quail are non-amenable. You could do those, and as long as you don't cross state lines. Uh, the other thing, if you have a facility like this, there is a retail exemption. So we just built a farm store using this way around my freezer. And so we're looking at, well, if I, I could make my own chicken sausage from our USDA inspected product, and uh, there's a retail exemption, I could ship it around the country. This is stuff I learned at APA, which I didn't think you could. As long as no one else is reselling it, and I'm selling directly to my customer, you, you can do that. So you could take fat from your hog and turn it into $20 a pound lardo, lardo which is an Italian like salted, uh, salted smoked meat. So this is my way of brainstorming a week long trip to Italy with my wife and writing it off <laughs> to go learn this stuff. But uh, I'm trying, Carla. So uh, yeah, so there's a lot of things like that. Um, but then you gotta be careful you don't get spread out too thin, you know, so. But that, those are some, if you, if you have, more questions, and any of this stuff, guys, reach out to me, uh, you know, or any of these guys, but you know, through the podcast, uh, folks email me all the time, so we answer questions. Great, I think that's it. Can we get a round of applause for our panelists?